Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Coral reefs are biologically diverse ecosystems that have evolved over hundreds of millions of years. They provide many important ecological services, such as commercial and sport fisheries, ecotourism, and protection of coastlines from storms and erosion. In recent decades, coral reefs worldwide have come under threat from a variety of human-related impacts, including nutrient pollution, overfishing, and climate change. The problem of excess nutrients on coral reefs has been monitored in detail for over two decades at Lou Key Reef in the Florida Keys by Dr. Brian LaPointe, a senior scientist at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute in Fort Pierce, Florida. Dr. LaPointe has documented a 100% increase in average concentrations of biologically available nutrients like ammonium at Lou Key since the 1980s. This is correlated with the dramatic decline of living coral throughout the Keys from greater than 70% cover to approximately 6% cover in the year 2000. The receding coral has been replaced with biota adapted to higher nutrient concentrations, such as macroalgae, sponges, and other opportunistic organisms. The Florida Keys are a chain of islands, or archipelago, extending for over 200 miles from Biscayne Bay to Dry Tortugas, about 80 miles west of Key West. These low-lying islands are comprised of limestone, or calcium carbonate, built by small coral reef organisms over thousands of years. Some 43 species of corals can be found on Florida Keys reefs, which along with hundreds of species of fishes and invertebrates, makes the marine biodiversity of the Keys comparable to that of tropical rainforests. The upper Keys are aligned in a north-south direction and turn 90 degrees through the middle Keys, so that the lower Keys run east to west. This orientation no doubt confused mariners for generations and contributed to the success of the wreckers, sailors who profited on the misfortune of merchant mariners who frequently ran aground on the Keys coral reefs in the mid-1800s. Today, the Keys are home to some 78,000 year-round residents and an additional 25,000 winter residents. Over three million tourists visit the Keys each year, generating more than $1.3 billion annually, much of this from marine-related activities. Harvard professor Louis Agassiz performed the first scientific study of the reefs in the Florida Keys in 1849. The study was commissioned by the superintendent of the Coast Survey because the Keys reefs were among the greatest natural hazards affecting American shipping. Agassiz was among the foremost naturalists of his time and a major intellectual force promoting field studies. He is perhaps best remembered for his words, study nature, not books. Working from the Coast Survey steamer Laguerre, Agassiz first described the offshore barrier bank reefs of the Florida Keys. There we have a continuous range of similar corals in unbroken continuity for miles, or even hundreds of miles, rising at unequal heights nearly to the surface. Louis Agassiz's primary conclusion to the superintendent of the Coast Survey rings most ironic to researchers like Dr. LaPointe who has observed firsthand the devastation of the Keys Reefs since 1982. You ask whether the growth of coral reefs can be prevented, which are so unfavorable to the safety of navigation. I do not see the possibility of limiting in any way the extraordinary increase of corals beyond the bounds which nature itself has assigned to their growth. Dr. LaPointe's PhD studies at the University of South Florida proved useful in understanding how land-based nutrient pollution from the Keys and the South Florida mainland could lead to the demise of the third largest barrier reef in the world. Dr. LaPointe arrived on Big Pine Key on July 4, 1982, 
and wasted no time diving into an active research program, initially working out of a small field station at Sea Camp, right on Big Pine. Well, it was late spring in 1982 when I got a call from Dr. John Ryder at Woods Hole offering me a postdoc. This was a dream come true for me to move to a place like the Florida Keys, which is a, a great environment for field research. So of course I accepted and uh, loaded up my, my Chevy van with my belongings and drove down to Big Pine Key. I arrived at Sea Camp and uh, we purchased a 10 foot by 20 foot Ted's shed, stuck an air conditioner in it, and that was our little field lab. We also purchased a 20-foot center console boat and also an aluminum John boat uh, as our research vessels. And out of those vessels, we, uh, we began a, a two-year project studying the physiology and ecology of seaweeds uh, in Pine Channel around Big Pine Key. Dr. LaPointe collaborated with Dr. John Reither from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts and other colleagues from Harbor Branch on an Energy for Marine Biomass program funded by the Gas Research Institute. We were looking at the nutrient ecology of several species of fast-growing seaweeds, uh, several species of sargassum, and uh, several species of gracilaria. To experimentally enrich these seaweeds held in the cages uh, with different concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus, we would go out there late in the afternoon, remove the seaweeds, put them in large, clear plastic bags that had concentrated solutions of either ammonium chloride or sodium phosphate. And uh, these algae then were allowed to sit in the bag overnight and assimilate those nutrients and then would continue to grow uh, after we put them back in the flowing seawater in the cages. At the same time, we talked about the need to begin a long-term monitoring program, and uh, we decided Lou Key would be the place to do this. Lou Key had this beautiful, unique spur and groove zone, unlike any other reef in the Florida Keys, where all the zones of the reef were clearly delineated. The back reef, the reef crest, the fore reef, and the deep fore reef. Within his first year of study, Dr. LaPointe made a major discovery with far-reaching implications for the Keys and beyond. Whereas all studies of coastal waters to date showed algal growth was limited by nitrogen, Dr. LaPointe experimentally demonstrated that phosphorus was of primary importance in controlling growth of many seaweeds in the carbonate-rich waters of the Florida Keys. The phosphorus limitation that we were seeing in these experiments was the result of of relatively high availability of nitrogen. And so we then posed the question, where is this nitrogen coming from? And one of the first sources we identified were septic tanks uh, on the watershed of Pine Channel. And this led to a proposal to Monroe County, who together with the state of Florida, funded a septic tank study to look at the level of contamination of groundwaters by septic tanks. The septic tank study uh, involved setting up monitor wells at different distances between the water and the drain field of septic tanks at approximately 10 different residences up and down the Florida Keys. The results of LaPointe's study were riveting. Groundwaters on developed lots averaged some 5,000-fold enrichment in nitrogen and 400-fold in phosphorus. Using a heat pulsing thermistor probe, Dr. LaPointe also demonstrated for the first time how these groundwater nutrients are pumped into coastal waters by the ebbing and flooding of the tide, stimulating algal blooms and over time, leading to cumulative buildup of organic matter or eutrophication. Because of the importance of phosphorus to uh, algal growth in these waters, we realized we needed to get a phosphate ban here in Monroe County to limit the amount of phosphorus that would be uh, delivered to the coastal waters through sewage discharges. So I worked very closely with uh, Monroe County Attorney's Office in drafting up an ordinance that limited cleaning products that come into Monroe County to only products that contain very low 
phosphorus concentrations. LaPointe's findings became publicized in the local media and caught the eye of a local environmental group, the Florida Keys Land Trust, who asked the researcher to become their director of marine conservation. He also attracted the attention of Florida writer Randy Wayne White, who based in part his marine biologist character, Doc Ford, on Dr. LaPointe. Okay, so fertilizer causes plant plankton to grow. It makes sense. You know, it made sense. And so I adopted that into the Doc Ford philosophy, this renegade scientist, Dr. Brian LaPointe, who, you know what, it just made sense. And uh, again, I am no scientist, but I, I read a lot. And uh, I've become aware that there are not very many independent thinkers in this world. And when I stumble across one, I, I try to use them as much as I can and, and give them very little credit. Well, one day I got a call here in my lab from the Florida Keys Land Trust, who uh, basically invited me to collaborate with them on a proposal to the MacArthur Foundation to secure additional research funding for my work, allowing me to expand beyond Big Pine Key, both up and down the Keys and also into areas of Florida Bay. We did successfully get this grant from the MacArthur Foundation and I became the Director of Marine Conservation. And at that point, the name was changed to the Florida Keys Land and Sea Trust. By 1990, scientists, environmentalists, and locals alike knew something was going seriously wrong with water quality in the Keys. Over 100,000 acres of turtle grass had died off from Florida Bay. Macroalgae and disease were overcoming the coral reefs. The water was losing its gin clear transparency to turbid opaqueness. The rotten egg smell of hydrogen sulfide was becoming noxious, where macroalgae and seagrasses washed ashore and decomposed. The ecological impacts that we were seeing happen in and around Florida Bay and the Florida Keys were clear symptoms of a real ecological disaster. Seagrass die off, proliferation of coral diseases. We were beginning to see white pox disease take quite a toll on Elkhorn coral. This was of great concern because it was Elkhorn coral that over geologic time scales built the reefs we now see when we go to Lou Key. The ecological disaster captured national and international media attention. Dr. LaPointe was interviewed about his research for publications including National Geographic and the New York Times Magazine. Articles carried headlines like Florida's imperiled coral reefs and lost keys. As the news of the massive ecological problem spread, it was clear that uh, the government needed to do something. And their response was to create the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary Act, which was passed in 1990. This new expanded sanctuary extended all the way from Key Largo to Dry Tortugas and up into the backcountry around Florida Bay and Everglades National Park and encompassed approximately 2,300 square miles. This was an interesting time here in the Florida Keys. We not only had the new marine sanctuary, but we also had the Everglades lawsuit that had been filed by the U.S. federal attorney. The attorney's office contacted me regarding my water quality research in Florida Bay and the Keys. Their concern was that some of the runoff from sugarcane farming was affecting not just the Everglades, but Florida Bay and the Florida Keys as well. In the end, however, the Everglades lawsuit only considered phosphorus pollution as it pertained to the proliferation of cattails in the Everglades. It did not include nitrogen, which my research clearly showed was the biggest problem when it came to Florida Bay and coral reefs of the Florida Keys. Resource managers questioning Dr. LaPointe's findings argued that his research depended on correlations and did not demonstrate cause and effect. 
LaPointe and his colleagues then performed additional experimental studies to demonstrate that it was indeed nutrient enrichment leading to the development of algal blooms and hypoxia, or low oxygen concentrations, in the Florida Keys coastal waters. We began to do more experimental work that involved dosing studies in microcosms where we would grow turtle grass and other seagrass species in culture and add different concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus. And through that work, we clearly showed cause and effect where when we added these nutrients, algal epiphytes and fast-growing macroalgae would come in and overgrow and ultimately cause die-off of these seagrasses. The other thing that we did was we purchased uh, these HydroLab datasons. These are multi-sensor uh, units with data loggers that we can put out on the reef or in a seagrass meadow for extended periods up to several weeks and get a continuous time series of environmental data such as dissolved oxygen, salinity, conductivity, and temperature. And it was through the use of the hydro labs that we began to get massive amounts of data demonstrating that these systems were becoming hypoxic or suffering from low oxygen, particularly during the evening and early morning hours. The National Science Foundation supported Dr. LaPointe as chief scientist on several research cruises in the Caribbean region, where he and his colleagues performed parallel studies in other areas experiencing problems of nutrient pollution, algal blooms, and coral reef decline. We even carried it further throughout the Caribbean to Martinique and other places. Brian was always the lead in the nutrient work, and we usually were the lead in the ecological work. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the work in Martinique was really groundbreaking work. We showed that uh, the sewage from the city of Martinique had, had uh, in, a, in addition to development of the shoreline by Club Med and all the associated uh, housing and so on, had virtually taken out a uh, very healthy reef in a period of just two years. While most scientists agreed with Dr. LaPointe that nutrients from sewage in the Keys was contributing to a water quality problem, none would concur with his observations of high nitrogen concentrations in Florida Bay. Dr. LaPointe hypothesized that agricultural runoff flowing through the Everglades was stimulating algal blooms in the bay, stressing seagrasses and corals. Opposing theories suggested the Everglades were a giant natural filter that removed all the nitrogen before it reached the bay. What was politically popular at the time in scientific circles was the hypersalinity hypothesis. And according to this theory, the water had become so salty in Florida Bay and on the coral reefs of the Florida Keys that we were seeing ecological problems of these algal blooms as, as a result of decomposing seagrasses. However, there was no scientific evidence demonstrating cause and effect that in fact the salinities that we were seeing in Florida Bay were in fact lethal to the turtle grass. In fact, there was a lot of evidence contrary to the hypersalinity hypothesis. To reduce salinity in Florida Bay, freshwater flows from the Everglades were increased between 1991 and 1995. The nitrogen-loaded water had catastrophic effects on the sensitive seagrass and coral reef communities of the Keys. In 1991, as the nitrogen loading and freshwater flows were increased, the first impact of these added nutrients was a massive bloom of cyanobacteria in central Florida Bay. As these flows increased even further in 1992 and 1993, we began to see the expansion of the cyanobacterial bloom from central Florida Bay downstream through the tidal channels of the Florida Keys. And these blooms uh, extended all the way out offshore over the outer bank reef. It was very, very clear to see from the air the, the magnitude of the impact of this dirty water 
flowing out over the reef. Following these massive increases in, in freshwater flows and nitrogen loading, between 1996 and 1999, we saw a 275 percent increase in coral diseases that led to the regional mass extinction of Elkhorn coral, a cropper palmata, due to white pox disease. Even as the Florida Bay Restoration Program backfired, it demonstrated what Dr. LaPointe had already concluded that agricultural runoff was a major source of excess nitrogen to Florida Bay that led to the widespread phosphorus limitation. The Mystery of the Everglades, published in New Scientist magazine, credited LaPointe with being the first scientist to show the importance of nitrogen enrichment from agriculture in the northern Everglades. I, I believe there's, as far as the sanctuary goes, I, there, there's no bad guys involved, I don't think. It's just people trying to do the right thing, but it's very complex, and I think some wrong decisions were made. I never subscribed to that hypersalinity theory. It just didn't make sense to me. So we used to dive that area, and you could get close to shore around Naples and Florida Bay and up the coast, and you could dive it in the springtime before the rain started. It was generally fairly clear. Diminished water quality and reef health have impacted tourism. Once the premier scuba diving destination in the world, the Keys were now seeing their chief economic asset disappear. Right now when people go to the reef, it used to be a, a wonderful experience. Now when you book a trip to the reef, the first thing you hear is free beer. Then they have gourmet food. Then they have music. The last thing on their list is see a living coral reef. It's sort of a sidebar to going out and getting smashed on a, on a boat. Because of his knowledge and experience with this problem, Dr. LaPointe was asked to write the coral reef section of the book Clean Coastal Waters, Understanding and Reducing Nutrient Pollution for the National Research Council. The news of Dr. LaPointe's nutrient research in the Florida Keys spread globally, prompting invitations to collaborate with scientists and resource managers working on similar water quality problems in other coral reef regions around the world including the Bahamas, Australia, Jamaica, and Tobago. Meanwhile, a committee of eminent scientists was tasked with reviewing the comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program, to date the world's largest and most ambitious environmental restoration program with a price tag of $8.5 billion, and one that promised to send even larger volumes of water and nitrogen through the Everglades into Florida Bay and beyond. Members of this committee also served on the Ocean Studies Board of the United States National Academy of Sciences, who met at Harbor Branch in March 2002. They specifically requested that Dr. LaPointe present a lecture on his nutrient research in Florida Bay and the Florida Keys. Dr. LaPointe's research was also used in the Pew Oceans Commission Report, released in 2003 that declared the Florida Bay, Florida Keys region a dead zone as a result of hypoxia from nutrient pollution in the 1990s. As news of flaws in the Everglades restoration program spread, flows of nitrogen-enriched water to Florida Bay were diverted elsewhere, notably to the St. Lucie estuary on Florida's east coast and to the Caloosahatchee estuary in southwest Florida. This simply moved the agricultural pollution problem elsewhere, exacerbating harmful algal blooms, red tides, seagrass die-off, fish kills, and mortality of endangered manatees. Dr. LaPointe was invited by Lee County officials to assess the emerging problem of red drift algae blooms that periodically fouled area beaches, including those on world-famous Sanibel Island. In 2002, Dr. LaPointe and his students showed how nutrient pollution and loss of coral reef habitat reduce stocks of snappers, groupers, and grunts at Lou Key, which has been a no-take zone since 1983. This research also documented how nutrient pollution actually increased stocks of grazing fishes, such as parrotfish and tangs. Beginning in 2001, Dr. LaPointe investigated harmful algal blooms impacting coral reefs between Broward and Palm Beach counties on Florida's east coast. 
he was soon to discover the alien invader Calerpa brachypus, a native of Pacific waters likely imported to Florida's east coast in the ballast of cargo ships or possibly by the aquarium industry. This generated one of the most prolific blooms to affect South Florida's coral reefs. Research using stable nitrogen isotopes allowed Dr. LaPointe and his research team to link the rampant spread of these blooms to land-based nutrient pollution, especially the ammonium-rich discharges from the ocean sewage outfalls between Miami and Delray Beach. By 2007, officials with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection announced that the weight of evidence on coastal water quality and coral reef health calls into question the environmental acceptability of continuing ocean outfall discharges. This echoed what residents of Key West had learned years earlier, aided by LaPointe's research. They cast their vote for clean water in a referendum to fund advanced treatment of their municipal sewage which means nitrogen and phosphorus are removed from wastewater leaving the treatment plant. Key West was leading the way in 2001. The city of Key West, in referendum vote, opted to upgrade this wastewater treatment facility to advance wastewater treatment standards, which guaranteed the removal of ammonia and phosphorus in its effluent. I think this is going to lead as a shining example to the rest of Monroe County and up the east coast of Florida to follow that lead. Finally, clean water policy appears to be spreading up the east coast of Florida, but the northern limits of Florida's threatened coral reefs also need protection from excess nutrients. Well, I do think there's an important lesson to be learned here. As scientists, we really need to be independent thinkers and not simply jump on scientific bandwagons. We know from what's happened here that the controversy I created through my hypotheses uh, in the end has advanced our understanding and science of the problems we're facing here in Florida Bay and the Florida Keys and is now leading to very positive steps to reverse this trend we're seeing. Uh, the development of advanced wastewater treatment technologies in the city of Key West plant is one example. Uh, the fact that the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan is now looking at the nitrogen issue uh, in the Everglades is another example of the improvement in understanding and managing ultimately our, our water quality. Many highways travel down, all great circles walk around. I get lost in my hometown, I feel bad sometimes. Of all the places I have been, and many things these eyes have seen, I still get crazy in my dream, and I feel sad.